and we're going to go get started. Uh, this is a uh, Smart Cities Today panel. I'm you know, happy to be up here hosting, moderating again. Uh, I'm going to introduce the, the panelists and then give them a couple minutes to say something about you know, their background, uh, what, they, what they've been working on. So sitting immediately to my left is Derek Johnson. Derek's a Senior Business Development Manager at EtherWAN. Uh, if you don't know EtherWAN, it's a leading manufacturer of hardened networking gear. Derek's uh, diverse background includes two decades of high-tech and sales biz development, um, brings a unique blend of direct industry expertise and unconventional thinking to EtherWAN and its partners. Um, Derek is, uh, for those of you who know networking, Derek has actually held two Cisco certifications and vast experience with Ethernet, media conversion, industrial Ethernet, fiber optics, and software-defined networking tech. Um, he was also uh, an original member on the board of directors of the Fiber to Home Council, uh, which was a consortium of companies dedicated to bringing broadband internet to Americans everywhere. Uh, thanks for that. <laughs> um, next is uh, Alistair Gallup. 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 My apologies. My, Al Alistair Gallup. Uh, Alistair is a uh, technology services engineering lead for Mott McDonald, uh, which is a consultancy in the United Kingdom. Uh, interesting fact, it looks like it's one of the largest employee-owned companies in the world, I saw online. Which is, um, Alistair's over 25 years of experience as a recognized ITS industry figure. Uh, possesses detailed knowledge of specialist tech uh, and equipment, including and standards and statutory requirements, extensive experience managing traffic systems infrastructure. So Alistair typically works with collaborative project delivery teams that are uh, spread apart you know, geographically and organizationally and has actually worked in quite a few places all over the globe. Uh, he also uh, authored uh, the respected book Traffic Signals, An Introduction to Signalized Junctions and Crossing Facilities in the UK. Um, along with numerous other articles, papers, and standards. And um, that's a good book if you forget which side of the road you should look at when you're trying to cross, <laughs> which is very common uh, for people like us in places like that. No, it's really confusing when I come here. I must say. Yeah, <laughs> it's very easy to get hit by a car. Right? So I've got, got my watch on the wrong hand, so oh, I remember which nice. way to drive. Nice. Uh, next is Greg Dotson. Uh, Greg is Vice President, Engineering Manager at Neil Schaefer. Uh, multi-discipline engineering, planning, and construction management firm. So Greg has over 20 years experience in engineering, including 17 in transportation, traffic, and ITS. So he started at PDR Engineers, spent about 10 years with Gresham Smith and Partners, uh, moved to Gannett Fleming, and most recently joined Neil Schaefer in July of 2015 uh, as an engineering manager for the Memphis office. So in addition to, I, I look at his bio, he's got a, quite a few mentorship and education activities, which are great. Uh, he's also involved uh, in ITS Tennessee. He currently serves as a board member. He also serves as the president of the Tennessee section of the ITE and uh, is a member of the leadership committee for Southern District ITE. And one of the interesting things I noticed was he serves on the STEM outreach for disadvantaged populations and communities subcommittee for the international ITE. So we thank you for that. Yeah. And then on the end, and uh, the grit smart grit hat, <laughs> we've got Dave Musso uh, to give us a city perspective. Dave has been the signals and lighting uh, supervisor for the city of Campbell, California for the last 20 years. Uh, prior to that, he worked for Peak Traffic, SMI Traffic Signal Maintenance, and Construction Company for five years, where he rose from a maintenance worker to supervisor of a crew of 10. So he's been very active in the Traffic Signal Association Silicon Valley chapter for about 20 years, uh, acting as president. Vice President, Secretary, and Treasurer. Wait, are there any of those that you haven't had then? I've had them multiple times. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, Dave was also one of the earliest folks in the Bay Area to give GridSmart a chance. So join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you, guys. And uh, I'll turn the floor over to you, Derek. So I thought it would be beneficial to, to share with you all some of the things that we've learned at EtherWAN with regards to the Smart City initiatives. And it really comes down to three things. And, and Money aside, we're not going to talk about money because we all know that without money, it's a non-starter. But three things that have been key to a smart city initiative being successful or failing. Uh, it's, it's about change, people, and security. So let, let's talk about change first. You know, there, there's a psychology of change that people don't like to change. Uh, inertia is like the norm, and, and change can be painful. If you've ever tried to undergo or entertain a, a diet, a health regimen, even when you're doing something that's good for you, change can be hard, right? And so when, when, when we think about change, there's key decision makers that we have to get on board who are critical to making change occur. And here's the thing, though. So we've got inertia on one hand of the human psychology, and then we've got the world flying by. Uh, there's a thing called the uh, knowledge doubling curve. 
And what it says is that up until the year 1900, the world's knowledge doubled about every 100 years. By World War II, the world's knowledge was doubling every 25 years. And now it's doubling every 13 months. So if you wake up and you think, oh my God, things are going so fast, it's not just you. The world's going by really, really fast. So the, the, the challenge is that there's, there's this, there's this uh, uh, obstacles with, with people wanting to change and inertia of human psychology not wanting to change, right? So, which leads us to the next part, which is people. Right? That's a psychological element. And one of the things that we noticed in terms of, of projects that were successful, they were, they were successful based upon two or three what we would call change agents within uh, the municipality, uh, the Department of Transportation Unit, what have you. Two or three people who were essentially the evangelists within the organization, the change agents. Uh, and that's, that's why it's important for you all here to realize that, that you might think, oh, I'm just one person. But if, if you want to be that change agent in your organization, if you want to, to offer that compelling vision and then get someone else on board and then another person on board, in the cities that we've worked with, there were always two, maybe three people that really were the driving factors of getting that ball going. And that's, that's so important because conversely, when we've seen some, some issues with some smart city initiatives, it was when we ran across a key decision maker who said, and I quote, I'm retiring soon, it doesn't matter to me, mm. right? And that's the problem, right? You, you've got this world that's moving faster and faster and faster, and you've got some, the choke point could be that one decision maker says, ah, I'm retiring, it doesn't matter to me, right? Mm. So all of you here can be the change agents to help push that by, push it forward. The other component to people is, get ready, there's a talent war coming. And one of the things that we've been seeing is, We'll get a phone call from someone that we work with on a project in one city, and he's saying, hey, guess what? I'm in the new city, and I want to bring you guys in for this project. In one specific case, and I won't name the city, <clears throat> the guy from ITS division was recruited away to one city, spent two years there, and then was recruited back at a much higher salary. So as you get this, all these disparate technologies that are becoming incumbent upon you, we're talking way beyond just signaling networking, cybersecurity, all the different things that you, you have to learn, the ones that rise to the challenge, if you step up and rise to that challenge, you're going to be heavily recruited. If you haven't seen it yet, stick around. You're going to see it. So there's going to be cities and municipalities and, and DOTs working really hard to steal people away from other departments. So that's why uh, yesterday when we were talking about the, the next certification class, I thought it's fantastic, right? because that's gonna help you guys get to the next level. So from the perspective of, of, of career growth, of your career path, of, of stability in your lives, that knowledge is gonna be critical. So what's the last part? The last part is security. And uh, let's see a show of hands. How many people here sat in some of Tony's uh, cybersecurity classes? Fantastic information, right? You, you, could, you could have charged for that, it would have been worth every dime because there's so much of security. And the thing is, you know, some of these hackers are diabolical in that um, they, they really go above and beyond cracking the network. And here's the thing, here's what we hear. It's ITS, where do you gotta get into, right? Here's the thing, right now you think you're ITS, but that firewall between ITS and IT is going to dissolve, and eventually it's just gonna be one big network. Back in April, did you guys hear about the Colorado Department of Transportation's issue with ransomware? Big black eye. Can you imagine coming into work and some hackers broke into your network and now you have to pay them to access your network? So, so the security aspect is really important. So in terms of, and I understand all of you are going to be drinking from the proverbial fire hose in terms of knowledge, networking, cybersecurity, ITS, all the different things that you have to learn but those of you that step up to the challenge are going to do really, really well. And that's one of the things that I'm, I'm excited about GridSmart is that when it comes to change, they're pioneering change. When it comes to people, they're help, helping people evolve. And when it comes to cybersecurity, they're on the forefront of cybersecurity. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be bumpy yet exciting for the next few years. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, 
So, um, Jeff kindly um, mentioned my book on traffic signals earlier. So, um, to talk about smart cities, I'm going to quote some bits out of my current book that I'm writing about ITS. Okay. The next one, not published yet, but um, anyway, I thought I'd go to that. So, what is a smart city? So, um, it's an urban environment where infrastructure and services are interlinked using technology. So, it's why do you do that? You do it to improve the quality of life by enhancing their operation. This means that for stakeholders, such interconnectivity provides a pathway to improve their services, whilst also accruing cost benefits by using shared infrastructure and data streams. Now, I think it's really important that the term smart cities is actually seen in a holistic sense regarding the overall management and operation of a city by a plethora of stakeholders, both governmental and private entities. However, because of the often disjointed nature of both government and commercial organizations, most people tend to look at it from an industry-specific perspective. So you just look at it from highways or whatever. Um, across the broad range of utilities and services operated in a typical city, there's been a wide-ranging move to adopt technology to manage our services. This gradual digitization has tended to be piecemeal in approach and has resulted in fragmented implementations, even within individual organizations. To get the most benefit out of these investments, it be, would be advantageous to use an overlying framework which allows for open data exchange exchange to bridge across these existing boundaries. Now we heard about in Virginia the hackathons and the benefits, the unexpected benefits you can get out of that open data capability. Um, so in addition to the benefits that open data can bring operationally, the common use of infra infrastructure can provide immediate cost savings to beleaguered city authorities. It has been common over years for different departments to deploy um, or use separate infrastructure. For example, duplicating communication systems for traffic systems, street lighting, or networking to civic buildings. However, to make the uptake of common features attractive to different entities, the infrastructure needs to be sufficiently flexible to cope with changing requirements and scalable to allow the system to have the capability to add large numbers of additional devices over the years. At the moment, we don't know what the requirements will be, say, in five or 10 years' time. So the infrastructure that we're laying down now has to have that flexibility in it to, to give that capability later on. Thank you, Alistair. Um, interestingly, uh, one of the questions I was going to ask was, uh, tell me how you define smart cities in no more than two sentences. And that was, those were your first two sentences, so thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Greg, we're going to get Greg's slides up. Yeah, okay. And I've, I've got 12 slides, and I've, I've got to figure out a way to get this done in about three or four minutes. So, uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about the City of Memphis, the Smart City Initiative. We were fortunate enough to submit one of the applications for the Smart City uh, grant. Uh, put on by the USDOT, and uh, we were one of 78. Uh, and obviously, we didn't win. Uh, but I think one of the wonderful things of that that process was to get the feedback, uh, and not only that, but a ton of opportunities, ton of grants that are available to do, if not the whole Smart City initiative, in, in terms of just holistically, but just from a piecemeal perspective of just being able to do something. So we've got a lot of intel and we'll be submitting, the city will be submitting uh, on that, on, on several of those, uh, you know, in, in the future. Um, we had a clicker for him. Clicker. Okay. Where do we hide the clicker? Okay, well, somebody just turned it back. You got it? You okay. got it, and, okay. yeah. gotcha. Uh, so the, the city of Memphis took the, the, the idea of trying to create public and private partnerships to, to handle the transportation challenges. Uh, one of the things that was really huge for Memphis is uh, we've got several are areas in Memphis, uh, they're disadvantaged, and it's because of that they, they don't have access to vehicles and reliable transportation. So uh, we have huge 
uh, global industry leaders in Memphis, FedEx, International Paper, uh, and you know we've got railroads, uh, we've got UPS has a major hub there as well. So one of the things that we said, hey, if you, you, you guys help us, we'll help you. Uh, we'll get your workers here, but help us to provide means to be able to do that. So that was one thing. The other thing was uh, making sure that we allow uh, goods to ship quietly and uh, cleanly through the city. And that's pretty huge for Memphis since we're uh, considered the distribution of, of, the, of the world, distribution center of the world, uh, the second largest cargo airport in the world. And again, FedEx is a major uh, uh, reason for that. So we want to make sure that when we're talking about smart cities, that it includes uh, the shipment of goods through the city, uh, hopefully, you know, hopefully seamlessly, and it's we're getting there. Uh, and then automation and analytics uh, to shrink the impact of sprawling infrastructure. I've got a slide here I'll show shortly about just the uh, the the urban sprawl that took place uh, in Memphis, with, which ended up you know causing a lot of uh, disparity uh, within the core of Memphis, and we thought. The city leaders at one point thought that the best way to, to tackle that was to just keep annexing here and there. Uh, and anyway, it, it ended up backfiring. We're actually in the process now of de-annexing uh, some of the, uh, the areas. So we got some, some smart city focus, uh, several there. One thing I'll just share with, and I think you, you mentioned something that was really key about the, the IT and the ITS, you know, that that boundary pretty much dissolving at some point. And you know, one of the things that's really kind of problematic for I'm sure a lot of uh, municipalities is the idea of you've got, you got miles of fiber from a traffic engineering perspective, a division, and then you've got the rest of the IT for a particular city or county. Uh, and it, it really, it, it, it makes no sense to have all of that access when we are part of the same government to not be able to use all of that infrastructure. So I think one of the biggest things for Memphis anyway is to be able to have smart and shared networks uh, to, uh, from, from all divisions of government to be able to ultimately uh, serve the citizens of Memphis. Uh, we, can, we can skip the next one, it's there. Um, well, you just skip one more, go back one. We're going really fast. Okay, so global leader, uh, one of the things that's really interesting about Memphis, because of the, the hub, 58,000 jobs uh, fit the categories. Again, the highest cargo uh, volume in the world. And so we've got kind of what's happening in Memphis, uh, what makes it the, the hub, if you will, is the four R's, run rate, runways, roads, uh, rivers, and runway, roads, rivers, and the other one. Rail. Rail, there you go, there you go, it's right there. Uh, so anyway, we've got all of that happening for Memphis. All right, you go to the next slide. Uh, transportation lines, which is awesome. Uh, we've, again, that public-private thing you'll see constant throughout Memphis. Tons of uh, groups that have jumped on board uh, knowing that we have this huge issue of this transportation uh, issue in, in Memphis, and they've come together. And again, this was part of the smart city application. But again, we're, we're, just because we didn't get selected didn't mean that we're going to continue trying to make sure that we do the best we can with what we have. All right, go ahead. Uh, the planning environment, uh, we've got several uh, planning uh, things happening. I'll just skip down to that Memphis 3.0 comprehensive plan. That's an awesome deal. Hadn't happened in 30 years in Memphis. And what the beautiful thing that I see about it is that it's causing people that weren't necessarily talking, groups that weren't necessarily talking, to actually start talking. Uh, so you've got, you know, you've got county government talking with city government. You've got public talking with private. You've got, uh, you know, when, we, when, you, when you're thinking about things holistically, you've got different parts of neighborhoods talking to other parts of neighborhoods, look, talking about what they want their city to look like, their neighborhood to look like, and the, you know, how that seamless go, is going to work seamlessly uh, throughout uh, Memphis, so that's an awesome thing. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so this is what I was going to just sharing with you. You can kind of see how just how crazy spread out Memphis is, uh, and 
it, 324 square miles and, and roughly 2,000 residents per square mile. It, it's ridiculous. And again, the idea was we're losing all this tax revenue because of property taxes, people moving out and far away. So if you move far away, we will come and get you. <laughs> uh, and so that was the idea. Uh, but we, it's, it strained our uh, you know, services, you know, fire protection, uh, and, and just services in general, sanitary, water, you have it, you, you name it, it's there. And so we, we, we've kind of come to our senses now, and, and we're actually de-annexing uh, some, some places as well. Uh, uh, just, just a little bit about some of the infrastructure, don't need to talk a little bit, about, not too much about that, other than the fact that uh, we, we are in a process of of interconnecting a lot of signals. Uh, the way Memphis works, it, it maintains all of the signals within, not only just in Memphis, but the suburbs as well. So close to a thousand uh, signals is, is a part of that. Uh, a lot of fiber in the ground, and it's, uh, again, that shared deal is, is hopefully something that's gonna happen uh, sooner rather than later. IT is finally getting involved. It's happened on the state level. Uh, T dot IT has, has, has really embrace the idea of, of coming together with uh, traffic operations. Uh, so we're really excited about that. Uh, so these are just some of the projects. Uh, I mentioned the whole deal about interconnecting some of the signals. Uh, and I, I guess I'll just say a little bit about the, the ICT, the Information Communication Technology. You know, we've got one of the things that I, that I keep hearing, I was at the ITS 5C conference last week in Jacksonville. And you know the, the talk, the, one of the main takeaways is big data and just what are we gonna do with all this data? Uh, and, and I think the, the hackathons and, and being able to, to bring people to the table to say how are we gonna mine this data you know, is key so that we just don't have data, but we have it to where we can share it. I love what VDOT's doing in terms of sharing that data, but we gotta be, figure out a way to, to be able to share it and share it in a meaningful way. All right, next slide. Uh, MATA, uh, this is huge for Memphis, and the reason being is because, because of the disadvantaged neighborhoods that we have in Memphis, many people don't have access to uh, vehicles. Uh, so MATA, a matter of fact, this week our mayor is actually in D.C. Talking, uh, tr talking to officials, trying to make sure we get some, secure some funding for, uh, for, for the public transportation side. And uh, Matt is doing some great things, got a long ways to go, but again, this Smart Cities initiative, the application that we submitted, uh, and all the initiatives that we put in there, are, are we're continuing on with as much as we, we can with those. Um, just an RFQ just put, came out yesterday about uh, an innovation quarter uh, that's gonna encompass BRT, uh, some of the DSRC stuff that you saw there, uh, and again, it, this all stemmed from the Smart Cities Initiative. Uh, Transloc uh, Rider is, is another thing that's really pretty cool. One thing that's, 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 that I'll say this, and I'll, I'll try to shit up here. Uh, <laughs> one thing that's really key is you got all this technology, you know, you got all these cool things happening, but we, we can't forget about the folks that don't have access to this. So you, you, you're creating all of this one, these wonderful technologies uh, but we can't, oh, we can't forget about the folks that don't have access to all this wonderful stuff. So that has to be a part of the conversation as well. All right, and I got a couple. I think we can just probably, we got some shared new stuff. Just skip through this. Uh, we get the <laughs> integrated approach, cool stuff happening there. We'll keep going. Oh, uh, yeah, and that's it. So that's Stephen Edwards' guy that uh, is a transportation program manager for the city of Memphis. So him and I have been working together quite a bit, uh, doing a lot of things in, in, in Memphis in regards to smart cities, so that's it. Thanks, Greg, that's pretty interesting. Bus rapid transit. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's interesting to hear about Memphis. Um, and we like, Dave, why don't you go tell us a little bit about um, so, City of Campbell. Yeah, so uh, City of Campbell's a small community in the Silicon Valley, uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And um, what we do, go ahead, next slide slide. Uh, what, what I did was I, I looked at the whole Bay Area and I said, well, uh, what is it that, you know, different cities are doing different things that are pretty innovative. And, and, you know, after I've been here a while, I see that a lot of other cities, not just the Bay Area, uh, my little community, 
is uh, doing a lot of some of the same things and, you know, uh, but integration, the way I look at it is not just a matter of, um, you know, just a, a moving our traffic a little faster, a little smoother, uh, but uh, it, it involves a lot more than that, or it can involve a lot more than that. And so, for instance, uh, they were able to shorten commutes on the Golden Gate Bridge uh, by eliminating the toll, toll, you know, taking tolls. And uh, next, well, so what happened is, is that they, they were <coughs> able to do that by taking a picture of your license plate and sending you a bill. So if you have the, um, you have this puck that you can buy or rent and it costs you a dollar less. But if you don't have it and you're a tourist living in, not even, you know, you can still go right through. Um, so uh, this is about the uh, Sunnyvale. They have what they call the Matilda Mo uh, Monster. And it, it, it's um, two main highways coming at an angle and a main thoroughfare going to <coughs> what used to be Lockheed. Now it's a, a big campus um, of high-tech companies anyway. A lot of traffic going through there. And then there's um, a bunch of side streets coming off, including a light rail that goes through there. So that's why it's called the monster. <clears throat> anyway, uh, one of the companies uh, that has central software wanted to try, they, they went to Sunnyvale and they said, we would like to try out our, our software in some part of your city. And, and you know, you challenge us. So they said, okay, well, we got the monster. <laughs> So they set it up, and they got working, and it was kind of a, you know, we'd like to sell it to you. And they said, well, how much is it? And they said, well, it's about $150,000. They said, well, it's been nice knowing you. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that kind of money. And they took it out. And uh, luckily, right down the street uh, is the Google headquarters in the next city over Mountain View. Well, because the traffic gets so impacted by this little area, people at uh, Google uh, employees talked to their upper management and said, what happened at this intersection? Why is it so hard to get through there? And uh, the upper management talked to the city of Sunnyvale and said, what happened? And they told them, you know, we, we were trying out this, this software and it worked, as you could see, but we, had it. we couldn't afford it. And they said, well, how much is it? And they said, they told them, and they said, here's a check. <laughs> Put it back. <laughs> so that's nice. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, but that's, that's in, so now that Sunnyvale is able to, you know, integrate that, that software and um, throughout the whole city, just because of the location, which not everybody has that, you know, <laughs> deep pocket, that's able right. to give them a check. But, um, so anyway, uh, uh, Santa Clara uh, County, they have an expressway going through our city. And they, the manufacturer and software provider for them, we were going ahead and we were getting, we were going through uh, getting a new system. And we decided we'd go with whatever the county had because of the expressway and trying to get people across the expressway and not hit another red light. And it's a kind of a challenge because a lot of the cities in, in our area don't like to communicate with each other or not, you know, directly. And uh, so uh, we had to go to the manufacturer and say, listen, we're on the same, you know, we're the same customer, basically. Can you give us, so they have an adaptive system, but we decided to go with, um, uh, I'm, I'm, mis uh, I'm forgetting what it is, but anyway, uh, it's similar to adaptive. Um, it's more like reactive. <laughs> so, uh, when they give us a signal uh, saying that they're at a certain cycle length, then we, we get the signal and we change our uh, cycle length to match what their cycle length is. And it's only because we were able to, you know, integrate the two softwares in, and luckily we got the same manufacturer. I don't think it would have worked if we would have had two different manufacturers. They had to make that. They had to make that special just for us. 
Uh, next screen. <clears throat> All the above. Um, so you may have heard that there's license plate readers, and you may have some of them, and uh, we have them throughout the Bay Area, and some of them are mounted in uh, street lights, and some of them are mounted on police vehicles. Um, and so there's that. Uh, next slide. Uh, oh, this is a big one in the Bay Area. We, so you can get an app that'll uh, tell you, uh, well, you, you say, well, I want to go to the ball game, and I want to get a parking spot at a um, parking location near there, and uh, where's the spot, and what's the pricing? And, uh, well, this one's closer, it costs a little more, or that one's a little further, and it costs a little less. But a lot of them give you a discount and you know an incentive to use their app, and uh, you go in there and you know pick it out, and it gives you on your app it tells you where the parking is and gives you a picture of the parking structure, and it's really neat. Uh, next, uh, Caltrans. So this is kind of low tech, and uh, some of the people have already mentioned it is wider um, striping for the automated vehicles. And uh, next screen. Uh, yeah, uh, Oakland. So they, so they had a big problem with potholes. And they, they really wanted to um, solve this problem. They introduced an uh, app for citizens to take a picture of the pothole, and it will automatically send in the GPS coordinates a picture goes right to them so they can see where exactly it is in the road. Um, and uh, they don't have to fill out any form or you know, uh, do any other thing other than take a picture of it and it goes right to them. So that's nice. Uh, Palo Alto, they're working with Audi and, and I think Virginia, uh, I guess the lady from Virginia was saying they're doing the same thing. And, if you have certain models, the A4, the Q7, the Q4 all-wheel drive or whatever, um, they, they have on the dash, it'll tell you uh, how to, how to, uh, what speed to go at if you want to get the next green light. And if you're at the uh, intersection, with, because it's a hybrid car, yeah. it'll uh, turn off and then five seconds before it goes green, it'll turn back on to get your attention, and, and now you'll move forward and get off your phone. <laughs> Next. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you may have heard of shot spotter, where, you know, if there's a gunfire off and, and uh, the police know exactly where the gunfiring was, and they respond, and there's a lot of them in the Bay Area. Next. Santa Clara County, again, they're, they're doing something that's kind of unique in the Bay Area, is they're, they're, they've got this detection that uh, watches the um, citizens in the crosswalks. And the, uh, it extends the ped time. So if you have slower people, and, and the thing is, is with the county expressways, they could be eight lanes wide and, and that's, uh, you know, it's already taking you a long time to get across there. So that, and people go pretty fast on these expressways, so they want to eliminate that hazard to the pedestrian. Next. All right. Thank that's you for it. that summary of uh, interesting things in the Bay Area. So, um, you know, we've, uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, but I'm going to ask that we all be concise. So Derek here is going to plane to catch and we went a little bit over our time. So <laughs> I'm going to. <laughs> So I'm going to ask for short answers, but uh, so one of the things is interesting. We, you know, we're we're in transportation. We talk about ITS every time I talk about smart cities. You know, we're talking about transportation. The question is, is what else does smart cities apply to that we're not talking about? I don't know if someone wants to open up with that. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that actually, um, in a lot of places, it's actually nothing to do with transportation at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, We've got a, um, what was called an urban team, it's now called Cities. Oh, no, sorry, it was Cities, it's now called Urban, but uh, um, who deal with um, 
this sort of thing worldwide. And um, actually, a lot of the time, it's about healthcare and education. Mm -hmm. So it's welfare type issues rather than actually transportation. So that's seen in the context of um, uh, ensuring that uh, a whole range of different things uh, are brought together. Mm -hmm. So it could be quite simple things, um, like actually disseminating information um, to users of healthcare provision in mm -hmm. places where it may not be easy to access this sort of thing or to provide um, access to people who have either mobility or cognitive issues. Um, but also, we look at how, you know, we're talking about sort of big systems, expensive deployment. A lot of places can't afford that sort of thing. So we're using mobile um, data provision and low cost uh, solutions rather than big um, systems. Mm -hmm. That provides then access for um, bottom-up type deployments, mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um, small small entities to get in and, and interact with things. I like that idea. The bottom-up. That's uh, that's you know you, you can do a lot by doing a little in a lot of places. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Any other? Yeah. There's there's there are, there's also the issue of in the smart grid, power. How do we use power? Where do we get it from? And <clears throat> there's all this talk about, you know, was it by uh, 2020 we're supposed to have 30 billion IoT devices connected, but what's going to power it? And how are we going to power it? How are we going to efficiently use that power? Is it going to be coal, gas, nuclear, renewable? So the big issue is a smart grid, and that's, that's a big component of smart cities. Understand. Mm -hmm. um, so, one of the things also that comes up when we talk about smart cities, and, and you know, Greg, you were mentioning it, uh, is data, the data being acquired. Um, I guess one of the questions uh, would open to the panel is how might, how might this data um, be either useful to citizens and or used to influence the behavior? So a couple of, uh, one of the themes that came up in a couple of concepts was a lot of, a lot of the impact we can have is actually by just changing people's behavior, right? So with that, uh, if anyone had anything that might like to think about how data might be used to change behavior? Well, one thing is is that you can't be prescriptive about the way that it's consumed. You have to make it agnostic so that people can actually uh, consume data in a way that's uh, convenient for them. So, it's, so that allows different people to develop different ways to interact with it, produce apps at the moment. Yep. But in 10 years' time, whatever the equivalent of apps right. is at that point, it'll be that. But it then allows people to know that they can, if they use this, they get an advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the other thing too, you know, we talk about, the, I mentioned the ICT thing, um, of just l making sure that we, we don't stop when it comes to making sure that when we're looking at the data and how we're disseminating, how we're looking at it and being able to put it into a format that's readable, usable, applicable to the, the entire uh, context of citizenry, right? We've gotta, we gotta make sure that, you know, I think one of, the, one of the things that happens a lot of times is, well, this is the way this app does it, we're just gonna copy paste. That context may be different in terms of you know what who's actually using the app you mentioned healthcare right i mean you know i'm thinking about my 80 year old mother uh, you know and using the app well you know the way i use it and the way she could use it would be totally different yeah. you know there's bigger buttons right there's big you know there's less reading and, and more just kind of straight to the point stuff so i think as we as we constantly develop ways to disseminate the information and build apps and whatever we just have to be mindful that you know it, we, we haven't arrived and we never arrived to the point to where we think we've just covered everything for everybody. Yeah, I, think, I think the other thing is you know, just collecting data for the sake of collecting data, that's pointless, right? Yeah. I mean, we have more information available to us than ever before. Uh, mm -hmm. Diets, fitness, health, right? But we have data, but what does that mean? So just, to, just having data for the sake of data is enough. It's, it's do we have data that people will act upon that will improve people's lives. Yeah. 
Yeah. How many steps have you done today? <laughs> <laughs> um, Analog. <laughs> So I, I want to try to keep this a little bit on schedule, and so I apologize for cutting this a little bit short, but uh, these guys, are, are most of them are around for a little while longer than they, so you can catch them um, after this. But please join me in thanking these guys for participating. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wish we had more. Yeah. Sorry. So we're going to roll right into the next session, so um, close out the day. Um, who's helping me move this podium? of Intersect, thank you for closing it down yeah. for us, right? Is uh, Patrick uh, Sun, is that, that is Patrick Sun. Uh, he's the Managing Director of the National Operations Center of Excellence. Do they call that the NOCOE or what is it? Uh, we go NOCOE or NOCO. NOCO, I like NOCO, I'll go with that. Yeah. The NOCO is dedicated to serving the emerging transportation systems management and operations community, which over the last few years I've learned is TISMO, yeah. right? T-S-M-O, TISMO, so that's... Uh, a new acronym uh, for some of you, maybe. So uh, while managing the nonprofit environment during the recent boom of transportation technologies, Patrick has provided resources and knowledge sharing with transportation technology developers, researchers, operators, and stakeholders. Um, so Patrick is a registered civil engineer with more than 10 years of experience, including transportation planning, design, operations, and construction inspection. He's a graduate of uh, California State Polytechnic University, Pomona where you earned the Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering and Master of Science in Civil Engineering with Transportation Emphasis. So Patrick's also currently in the Executive Master's in Leadership Program at Georgetown University. So thanks for coming, Patrick. Yeah. It's great to have you. Appreciate it. I, uh, I didn't realize they, I, I sent my longer version. I, I usually have a more raunchy one, but. <laughs>
Catherine's presentation, you heard her say what that means is. What I am here, most of my slides are gonna be things that I'm just gonna run through where I didn't wanna spend time, but they will be available for you to look at also on our website. I wanted to come because I wanna say there's something working in our industry right now, and it's, it's critical to the mission of the National Operations Center, which is knowledge sharing is actually working. This whole idea, we come to conferences, we get ideas, or we listen and we hear, and then you look for resources, and it's working. And SPAT Challenge is kind of my shining example of the fact that it is working for a couple different reasons. Um, one, it's backed by a volunteer group that's really putting together the resources that everyone is using. And two, there's a central place where we're getting all of that uh, information and sharing it. And so we're building off of the lessons that we're learning from each other, uh, and that's really working. Um, I, we also kind of had this catchphrase, the states or the agencies that are actually deploying this and implementing and becoming operational, they're really embarking on local pilots, but they have this national significance. And so I think there's a lot of things that just came together. Um, and I won't even take credit because all the center really did, the National Operations Center, is really just house and promote the resources that are available. But there are a few things that we've noticed over the last year, year and a half, that I wanted to make sure everyone's on the same page about. One, we kind of, you guys get it, it's the SPAT messages, but there's another element which is the map message that needs to be complemented with your signal phase and timing. Everyone starts to focus on what is the controller doing, what is the controller doing. For the vehicles, they need a map message. And what do we mean? So when you look at it, there's possible applications, right? Um, you know, red light violation warning, you saw some of the uh, Audi stuff with like eco arrival and departure, you could do that through DSRC or cellular. But the more important thing is when you're trying to broadcast a SPAT, the vehicle, it does it no good if you just tell it red, yellow, green and which direction you're going. So in reality, huh, what we really need to do is have details of all the lanes as nodes and the crosswalks and the connections and even the paths that the vehicles are, are embarking on. This is incredibly important as you go and you start to think about what is this new digital age? What are the requirements we're gonna need to force on ourselves? And everyone talked about connected vehicles, but when those um, you know, people got in that room about October, September, October of 2016, and they were brainstorming this, they didn't know how important this map message is. And so later on we learn and then there happens to be a lot more resources available dedicated to this. And so I wanna make it clear that as we start to move into this digital, we naturally as engineers or as technicians and as maintenance will start thinking about the signal controller and just the parts that we work on. But you gotta also keep in mind the receiver of that information. And in this case, it's vehicles or other machines they don't know what the intersection looks like. They don't know what it means to make a left turn unless you literally draw it out, draw at that path. So it's very interesting, and this is that first kind of step into this arena that we're looking at in the future. So as the theme of this year's conference was to get your hands dirty, I literally had a lot of stuff that, um, resources that I wanted to update all of you on. And before I get to that, the journey of what it is, is if you go on our website right now and you look at the map, 26 states or geographic states are committed to meeting the National SPAT Challenge uh, criteria, which is 20 intersections in all 50 states by 2020 broadcasting SPAT. And when we say states, we mean geographic, we don't mean just state DOTs. In Dece November and December of 2016, there were maybe a handful of agencies, I'll even say, not even states, agencies that had some inclination of connected vehicle broadcasts of any type. And we're talking Michigan, Virginia, and maybe California, okay? Those were probably, th this was before even the pilots came out on all. Since that time, with the launch of the National SPAT Challenge, with no funding, no policy, and no um, top-down like, objective from FHWA, they were very supportive of it. A lot of the materials we actually got from them, so it's not like they haven't been in the picture. 
But without any of those, just the sheer fact that the challenge, the endorsement by the practitioners, all of you and your peers around the country, the buy-in from leadership, and the sharing of the resources. These resources that have come up are literally the collection of resources that those leading and bleeding uh, um, agencies and mesh them together and boiled it down to not necessarily the CV applications they might be focusing on, but just SPAT. Just so that all of you and anyone else that picks up the document, how useful is it going to be, and that was the criteria, to only broadcast SPAT. Broadcasting SPAT is a baseline, but it's very hard, and that's why we wanted everyone to get their feet wet in order to understand connected vehicles. So you can see with the resources that are available, uh, everything from how do you select corridors. We talk about DSRC, 5G. How many of you have even gone through the, the licensing process with FCC for SPAT? It's only a few, maybe one, right? What do you mean we have to register with the FCC? That was never in our playbook, in our processes, in our day-to-day. -day. But because of SPAT, this is what it's becoming, because we're using that spectrum. You have to become a licensee. That's the whole point of why there's a big fight. You know, it's licensed. Um, you got to do it. They were also updating it recently with some CONOPS, with some functional model requirements, and um, a lot with the webinars. So I'm going to just run through some of these uh, in an effort to kind of close out the conference that when we do, you know, even say get your hands dirty, it means a lot more than just hanging the radio up on there. There's so much more that needs to be thought of, and even the early steps are a little bit more complicated. Just to let you know, uh, there's a few more uh, resources coming. The sample SPAT documentation, you can probably get some historical SPAT um, actual messages, see what these messages are. It's one thing to always talk about, oh, these connected vehicle messages, and you know, go and start to read what that data actually looks like. Uh, there's a few historical data, uh, data sets out there. And when we talk about implementation, this is what those uh, early deployers and implementers said kind of just helped them in terms of understanding how to even get implemented, how to even implement. So I'm only going to give you a snapshot to let you know and get you a teaser, a little bit of the flavor of the type of quality of the information that they've shared. This is all available on the website. There's no restrictions. You don't need to give me your username and password as much as I wanted to. I was like, that's just going to be too much work for you. The most important thing that you need is to read it and understand it and then ask questions. If you realize your process is a little bit better, provide that feedback. It's a two-way communication street. So one of the examples um, are the performance requirements. And when we say performance requirements, we're really talking about even just for red light violation warning, how frequent, how fast are these messages being broadcasted? That needs to be kind of defined, and it, and it is. So you don't need to reinvent that. You don't even need to have conversations about it. Just reference it and just use it because it's worked, and it is working because there are operational uh, sites all around the country. And then it gets all the way into like what type of antennas or reference points. Um, I don't even exactly know what that means, but someone in your team has to understand or is connected to someone that knows what it means and knows that you're meeting that particular performance requirement. That's the importance of this process and this learning experience by getting, actually getting your hands dirty. Because if you didn't know about this, if someone didn't already give it to you, we would not even know. RTCM, uh, I always think it's like real-time correction measure, but it's not. It's, um, uh, does anyone know what it means off the top of your head? I always get the acronym mixed up, but it's the correction measure that you actually need to sort out uh, relative GPS accuracy with absolute GPS accuracy, right? It's complicated. We have a performance requirement. We're still figuring out how much do we really need it. So that's where we need more people to get involved and actually try it out and see if before your applications, for your deployments, did you need it? Um, Utah is doing transit signal priority with SPAT. Do they need it? They're figuring it out. You can sit there with engineers and researchers and computer programmers and try to define it out, or you could just do it. And we're at a point in our industry where we're saying for this, 
for SPAT as a baseline, just do it. Um, not that I want Nike to, you know, um, get with me. There's also something that I wanted to make sure you're aware of. When you go and you look at it on the website, there is a thing called a SPAT challenge verification document. This is what we worked with the OEMs and asked them, what do they need to make sure that what you all broadcast is, can be received by vehicles? It's one thing if a CODA RSU and a CODA OBU talk to each other. It's another if a CODA RSU and a Savari OBU talk to each other, roadside unit, onboard unit, right? So roadside infrastructure, OBU on a vehicle, right? Interoperability is a crucial if we don't get it right. On top of that, do the automakers from their radios inside their vehicles, can it actually read and understand the message? It's one thing to receive it, it's another to understand it. And I will say the latest version of the standard, the data standard, works very well for interoperability. If you ask some of the early people, the version two, threes, they had a lot of issues. The version four and the latest one for J2735, for the data standard, it works. Um, it works because we've actually tried the interoperability testing beyond just one agency and one manufacturer. When you look at how do you select your corridors, they had already put into thoughts and processes or just even actions of how they went and selected corridors. So they wrote it, put, pulled their resources together, and then you know some of the things that they came up with is you have to look at whether or not um, you have a corridor that just meets an eventual B2I application need. So instead of trying to go broad into your entire system, into your entire network, look at your corridors where a specific V2I application that's supported by SPAT, so curve warning messages, SPAT doesn't really support because you, get, you don't have a traffic signal at your curve, right? Uh, you might, but just think of like a two lane highway out there. You might have a different RSU that broadcasts a different message. So in order for this to have two, three X benefits, your return on investment for those V2I applications, find a corridor that meets the needs. And it seems very simple, but it isn't until you get into the weeds of this a little bit more, um, and even the compatibility. Is, your, uh, is the infrastructure that you have ready for it? Even if you plan on upgrading, it's not ready now, so it doesn't help you. So if you have a plan and your corridor has copper and you know you're gonna replace it in five years, although your funding might only be available for like half the corridor, that's not a very good corridor to choose right now because it doesn't let you try anything. And so what we also look at is when you look at the operational aspects of your corridor, are you operating with traffic volumes at near capacity during peak hours or not? Congestion relief. Um, that might benefit from some of the speed harmonization or just, you know, the, uh, they call it equal approach and a departure. But we really needed people to start to choose corridors. Be very, very selective in how you do it. That's how you get from that small one to the large one. And that's why we even take this approach of local pilots of national significance. If everyone does the same type of corridor, there's learnings there. If everyone does the same type of corridor with different applications, the learnings magnify, right? So we might have corridors that all have basic infrastructure that is common. Fiber, upgraded, upgraded controllers, um, you know, real-time connections with your TMCs, all that's there, great. Utah does transit signal priority, Arizona does uh, traffic signal preemption for first, re first responders, emergency vehicle preemption, Another agency just does eco approach and departure. Or another one does snowplow uh, location and, um, and information. But that baseline is the same. We learn from making sure and we get really good at it. The applications we learn from understanding where your next corridor is gonna be. So that the learnings from Utah for transit signal priority can be shared with everyone else. You know, so that's something that's worth looking at. And you have to be a little bit more deliberate and careful. Traffic signal vendors, controller vendors, had said some of their controllers are actually compatible. 
and it sort of is, and it sort of isn't. Learnings from that are in some of these documents where you can get some of these things worked well together and some of them didn't. Uh, and you have to go through that on your own system. Uh, and so when you find one that works, what, is your, what can your agency do? Michigan and Virginia, they went statewide. They said every single traffic signal controller from now on that they purchase meets these specification re um, uh, requirements. And that's really what was discussed and the approach of, okay, now they will be ready to be upgraded. Because the incremental cost of upgrade is cheap. I'm talking a couple thousand dollars. Pennsylvania went from eight to eight intersections to 24 intersections, and they're planning, I believe, in Philadelphia, citywide, over 150 intersections. Because there were incremental costs that they just had to do on the hardware side. And then they had CMU do a lot of the software, so they had a kind of a two for one on that. But the Secretary of Transportation in Pennsylvania said, how much? And then they gave her the estimate of that incremental difference. And she said, great, here's the money. Again, agencies are finding ways to fund this because sometimes the improvements and the upgrades are not as much as people had originally anticipated. On the flip side, software costs are a whole new ball game for all of you. If you're, if you're thinking you get everything that you need by hanging up the radio, stop right there and reevaluate your software costs, even if you can do software in your agency. Some agencies are prohibited from writing any sort of code, even if it's to upgrade their software or fix a maintenance problem. Be careful. Your, your software policies are coming into play. If you're going even further and you're like, okay, I just started, I have a corridor, but I need a little bit more. What is the concept of operations? What's a ConOps? Instead of creating your own, they created a model ConOps. Use it. Has most of everything that you need, and it walks you through what you're looking for. There's two documents they also did as a companion. They're standalone, but they're related because the other one looks at the functional requirements, both from, I believe, from a physical and a digital. And it's really to help you adapt your local site conditions, your local policies, and address your specific needs. And these are literally working drafts, so you don't, they're not prescriptive. They're just, they're just literally from the people who started first. They said, this is what we went through, and this is what ended up at least working for them. So you can see this gets pretty detailed and, de and technical, but they do still look at the best way to sell this is your V2Y CV applications, your V2Y connected vehicle applications. That's how you're gonna sell it to, your, to higher ups and to the legislators or to your executives. But the start, so you still need to have that and you work your way back. Um, procurement. Procurement is one of the hardest things to figure out in this for a lot of agencies for many different reasons. Sometimes your own procurement agents and officers don't even overthink what you're asking them for because you're selling them on the big picture. So it would probably help, and so we've put out, um, and they've been able to share four different agencies along with the specs for RSU from USDLT, uh, three states and one county. Um, and this is where, where you see Michigan DOT and Macomb County. Macomb County is within Michigan, and Michigan DOT did that broad spec uh, that they have for any new upgraded controllers will be uh, SPAT and connected vehicle ready. Macomb County took that and then just modified it a little bit just to make sure that it matches their particular needs and so that they're on the same system. You know, but after you do all that, you still need to be able to make sure that what you broadcast is usable by the vehicles. You know? And so that's where that verification document has. Where the verification, doc it, the verification document is not even a, a required document, but it's the OEMs asking the infrastructure owner operators, can you do this for us? And then we'll come and see if it actually works. So there's been a bit dialogue, a, a little bit more of the dialogue in the um, overall national uh, dial um, conversation. And you know, I kept this presentation short because I didn't want to, one, 
I'm not the right person to go through those con op documents and tell you what each and everything and every box is. Um, it's been a long time since I did anything systems engineering, uh, so I probably would need to get retrained anyway. Uh, but what I started the presentation and I told you that the knowledge sharing is working. We have agencies that have been able to take their development time with these resources to deploy SPAT very, very, in a short, in literally a year and a half. We went from maybe three states, geographic states, to 26 states. 200 plus signals are operational right now. That means you could go somewhere in this country, and our map has it, if it has a blue pin, I can't get it up here, I should have done a snapshot, I have a different thing, slide deck, but 200 signals that are operating. So if you think this, isn't, this is really hard, go and find out. Drive to one of them. Virginia has them up and operating. Pennsylvania has them up and operating. Michigan, they're nearby here. Um, if any of you want to drive all the way to Arizona, then be my guest or fly. Uh, you know, it's up to you. And we have at least counted right now over 1,500 planned. And that's only about 25, 26. So we're getting closer to critical mass, right? And this is just SPAT broadcast, SPAT and MAP broadcast. When you look at the overall connected vehicles and you look at the three pilots, Wyoming, New York, Florida, they're doing a lot more things. Wyoming's doing a lot with uh, wind warnings and those type of non-SPAT uh, connected vehicles. And I think Florida is, still has some SPAT in it. So this is where we have actually responded. All of the practitioners across the country have come together and it's working. That's why I say it's a shining example. I don't remember a time, even in my last 10 years, where rapid deployment and becoming operational with a new technology was this quick in our industry. Fiber optic, we're still working on fiber optic, right? I mean, how many of you agencies are not 100%, are not 100% fiber? Yeah, we're still working on it. Nothing in the future is gonna be supported by copper because it just can't handle the, the bandwidth and throughput um, demands of the new system, right? So fiber optic was something we started, I think even before I got into the industry, I think it has been about, um, some of you might know, like at least 10, 15 years ago, um, where it was coming out, and then finally we had economy of scale on it, right? Um, so that's becoming really important. But a few more things I wanna mention and then I'll open it up for questions. One is, a little quick uh, tip, and when you purchase the RSUs, get the software development kit. And when you go to the, through the procurement documents, you'll see reference to that. Sometimes if you buy it at the procurement, it's cheaper. When you buy it later, it could cost more than your actual hardware, okay? Software development is a, is a hidden cost in all of this that we have yet to figure out and every agency is finding out on their own how to handle it. Your own rules, your local rules and policies are gonna govern on that, okay? Software development kit. If you put the RSU out there and you think you're broadcasting and you sort of verified it and you have no one on your team or no partnership to actually figure out what you can do with that data, you gotta think a little bit ahead. Even for cities, find a university, a college, they'll work with you. Pull your resources or go to your state DLT and say, hey, we'll give you our data feed, pump it into your analytics and then just put it for our locations. Maybe, maybe not. If we don't do that, it's gonna stop, it's gonna stay. So please don't do that, so think ahead. Use partnerships. Go to your other agency partners that can actually have it. So if you hear your transit agency is investing in analytics or they have some data folks, Pump it into them. Uh, if any of you are from Texas, they have a, they they are really approaching a region and sharing as much as they can. And I think both universities in Texas, UT Austin, and even TTI, they're all in this game. They'll do it. So you don't need to have that horsepower, but you need to have the MOU, the partnerships, and the agreements set in place so that when you do become operational, you know what to do with that. So with that, let me just end there. Um, I wanted to respect all of your time. And uh, please um, register for our newsletter. We come up with the resources. Um, the webinars, 
we, have, we break them out into clips. They go into a lot more detail that I really encourage you, if you have nowhere to start, watch the webinars. They're um, split into clips, even on our YouTube channel, but it's on the website, and you'll get different aspects of what you need to take into consideration. Um, our newsletter, we're just gonna keep giving you updates as soon as these resources get updated. So with that, if you are doing SPAT and you're not on the map, please send to me, there's no problem with that. But um, we want it to be there. I think we are gonna get all 50 states. Alaska is a little bit hard. Um, I think they have maybe 10 signals statewide um, or they have not a lot of signals. So they, you know, we'll have to do an exception for them. Um, but they're the only one that we've kind of come across. But it's still hard. Montana, you know, I, I need to go and engage them. But any questions or experience?